yeah, we're now live on YouTube, Chair. Perfect. Thank you. And I think a few more people will join us um, over the coming minutes, but I'm sure they'll pick up where we are. Thank you to everybody for joining the Climate Change, Environment and Growth Executive Advisory Panel meeting today. For those who are wondering, we've got a larger uh, cohort today because we've got uh, an engagement session relating to home composting and ecological um, gardening which I'm sure members will find um, very useful. So that is on the agenda as the first item, uh, first substantive item. To kick things off quickly, with the first little bits of the meeting, we'll just check for any apologies for absence from the normal group. Uh, no, we don't have any apologies from the, the usual group, no. Perfect, thank you. And are there any uh, declarations of interest to be made by those members that are normally on the EAP and that will contribute later in the meeting? can see head shaking, so that's fine. And hopefully members will have had a chance to uh, look over the minutes of the last meeting. Are there any issues with that? Are we happy? I can see thumbs up. I can't hear any noises to the contrary, so we'll um, accept those. And now I believe I'm going to pass over to David Garrett, who's going to take us through the first session. Um, so over to you. Thanks, Harriet. Are you happy for me to share my screen? Yes, please do. There we go. Harriet, can you give me a thumbs up to let me know that's working? Brilliant, thank you. Thanks for inviting me um, along to talk to your session today. Um, so what I'm going to do is give a bit of a background to Garden Organic, who we are, um, but then talk about sustainable gardening. And so to do that, I'll talk about the sort of an introduction to the principles of organic gardening with a strong focus on composting and the, the, the efforts that we can all, all do to basically reduce our impact on the climate and in our own back gardens. Um, so that's our focus here, really. Um, as I understand it, I'll do a presentation for about 15 minutes or so and then open for questions at the, at the end of that. Uh, so my role, I'm David Garrett. I'm uh, Head of Knowledge Transfer for Garden Organic. My role is um, overseeing much of our charity's outreach work. So we are a UK-wide charity. We're based uh, just up the road um, on the outskirts of Coventry um, on the A45. So we were set up in the 50s by uh, the chap in the middle, uh, Lawrence Hills, set up down in Bocking in Essex. He was a journalist, a writer, um, fascinated by gardening and, um, and growing. And he came across the work of Henry Doubleday, so the chap to the left of him. Henry Doubleday was around in the 19th century. He was a Quaker smallholder um, and he had done lots of research into comfort. So this plant that grows on verges, um, absolutely spreads everywhere. Um, but what it's got is really deep tap roots. They go deep down into the ground, and they bring nutrients up into the leaves. And those leaves you can harvest two or three times a year and create your own liquid feed. Henry Doubleday's research was around using comfrey um, as a, a sticky substance on the back of stamps. Never materializes that, but Lawrence was just, admired his work and what he'd done. And so he set up our organization in his name. So it was the Henry Doubleday Research Association. Set up on the foundings of citizen science, really. So um, he asked members to take part in experiments in their own back gardens, feedback the results, and then he would then write those up and share them out. So it's the foundings of citizen science. And that understanding that actually every garden is different and that could be size of garden, the soil type, the climate around us. So there's so many differences there. And so what he did was collate those and share those around so everyone could learn. And we continue to do that. We've done that over the years. So around 60 years of evidence-based research and knowledge that we share around organic growing. 
there's a picture there of uh, Lawrence sat in front of his um, bungalow um, at Wrighton. So we moved up here in the 80s, mid 80s. Um, some of you might remember um, All Muck and Magic, um, which was the first TV gardening show um, that was broadcast on Channel 4. Um, that was filmed here. Um, but we are, like I say, we're a membership organisation and we've got around 20,000 members um, around the UK and some internationally. And typical um, magazine, that sort of stuff. Um, but what we do is we really share that organic message. My role within outreach is to engage people, share that knowledge. We are, as an organisation, we're collaborators. We want to work with people. We want to share that, that organic knowledge and that experience to support as many groups as we possibly can and encourage them to use horticulture um, as a tool for engagement. There's so much positive and good that can come out of it. There's a picture at the top there. Um, we had a garden at um, most recent Gardeners World Live up in Birmingham um, and won gold for that. That was a big, sp um, small space, big ideas garden. Um, this identification really you can have a really sustainable organic garden in a really small space. It doesn't have to be a really large growing area or garden that you've got. So we use five principles of organic gardening. Um, and I should say that we as Garden Organic are different to, we're not a certifying body. We're there to support. Our, our focus is very much householders, community gardens, um, and sort of community growing spaces. So the principles of organic gardening, what I'm gonna do through this session is just touch on each of those, but I guess I'm gonna take a bit of a focus on the build and maintain soil health. We have a principles of organic gardening booklet. It's a guide and it's a, it's a guide to encourage people and advise people to become as organic as they possibly can be. It's not a letter of the law, this is this, that is that. We want to guide people to become as organic as they can be. And so we have the best practice, good practice, also acceptable and not acceptable. And I guess the essence of organic gardening and what we do with sustainable gardening is it's working with nature rather than fighting against it. So our first principle is around build and maintain, maintain soil health. It all starts with soil, looking after your soil and really caring for that soil. Healthy soil is healthy plants. And so there's various things that you can do to support that healthy soil. You can minimise cultivations. So that's where you might have come across no dig. So um, not digging, adding a mulch instead, um, trying to add as much compost as possible. Of course, to do that, you need that source of compost. And so I'll come on to that. But adding that that organic matter is really, really beneficial. The soil is alive. There's billions of life forms within that soil. And it's, it's really important that, that we care for that. Um, it's often seen in sort of large, in, in, in an agricultural scale, where life is gone in the soils because we've, we've, we've harvested that many crops that we're not replenishing the organic matter, we're not caring for those soils. It's a really, really important thing to, to consider. Composting at home, and this is where, this is something that's really important for us and our charity, and we, we see composting as the cornerstone of organic gardening. We, in what we do, we work with lots of local authorities um, to support volunteer programmes. So we have a master composter volunteer programme that we, um, we recruit, support, engage with volunteers who then go out into their local communities and carry forward these positive messages. Composting, I, I find is just one of those really, we, we're often, we watch a lot of, and we hear a lot about climate change and, and there's this pressure put on us to, to make changes. What can we do? Some of them easy, some of them a lot harder. Composting is one of those easier ones. It's looking into your own back garden, that own little patch of land that we care for and identifying, okay, what do we waste? How can we do better with that? The beauty of composting is that actually you've got a, a waste product, which could be 
be your fruit and veg scraps. Um, it could be your shrub cuttings from the garden. It could be um, anything, all that sort of organic material. You're processing that in your own garden. So you're, you're composting that. That, that could be in a composting bin. It could be just in a heap. It's, of course, it's a natural process. It happens on the forest floor or all around us. It doesn't have to be in a um, contained bin. Um, but a lot of us like that, the tidiness, I guess, uh, of that. But then you get in the compost at the end of the process. And that's, that's then a free resource that you can use. And, and, and that is going to really, really benefit your garden. A compost bin, just the typical garlic bin, can can take around 150 kilograms of waste per household per year. So when you when you think about that in the grand scheme of things, that's a lot. We also find that when engaging with people around around composting, it, it opens people's eyes to actually the kitchen waste that they're generating. They start to see that a lot more and and therefore reduce the amount of food waste that they're producing it's it's also a, a general understanding of am i putting things in the right bin i talk to a lot of councils um that have so the garden waste collections contamination rate within garden waste collections because people are not necessarily putting the right things in there it's, it's all about this knowledge that's attributed to it. So starting with composting and understanding of composting will then lead to people better understanding the, the bins that they have available to them. We don't, we're not against garden waste collections. Actually, a composting, composting at home can sit alongside the use of a garden waste collection. Also food waste collections as well. Um, it's making best use of them. They're a brilliant service where they're available. Um, so it's, it's making best use of those services. Um, but by doing that, you're also changing those other behavioral aspects as well. Um, we often talk also about hot composting. So how can you process food waste at home where, where perhaps a collection of food waste is not is more difficult? Um, can you deal with that food waste at home? And there are bins available that can that can do that. Obviously, we talk more so about the, the circular economy um, now, but I just use that the waste hierarchy just to emphasize the importance of composting and where it sits, really. Um, it's it's a really important aspect that we can that we can all do, we can all pick up on. And you don't have to have a big garden to be able to compost. Take a look outside. But what space it could be on a balcony and you just got some green you could have a wormery on a balcony and it'd be brilliant and that little chart in the corner i i, I quite like this in the in the sense of as, as i've just been describing i'm producing that waste in my own back garden i'm then going to process that waste i'm taking ownership for the waste that i'm producing i'm then going to make use of that brilliant compost at the end of the process and, and use that on my garden and make my garden a healthier space and and then that, in turns, it, it's a circular system. Our second principle is around encouraging biodiversity. Again, we've got a link there with composting. The composting process helps to encourage biodiversity. And that's in a good sense. I know that some of you will be thinking, OK, composting, biodiversity, rats. I wouldn't expect rats to be visiting a compost bin if you're putting the right things in there. It's if you follow the advice and all the support that we've got available around composting, there's there's no need that rats wouldn't be visiting there. Um, but in an organic garden, you're really thinking about what's out there, what's what's in the garden. I always encourage people just to look, take that little bit of time to just look around the garden and just. Perhaps whilst it's watering, um, sensibly watering um, the garden, but just looking around the garden and identifying these creatures because it's amazing how much you'll see when you just stop and look. There's a whole web of activity. And what we're trying to do is encourage, we want, we want hedgehogs in our gardens. We want 
this wildlife to be able to, these frogs, toads, to be able to access our gardens. And so thinking sensibly about what we can do. Look after your predators. So there's a whole topic area on identifying predators. So you've got the adult ho hoverfly there um, and you've got the hoverfly larva. It's, they've all got a got a place in the garden and you might look at a plant and think oh it's covered in something what am I going to do rather than reach for a chemical and say okay I'm just gonna spray it with a chemical and kill it all wait watch it I just encourage you just to wait and watch and see whether a week later actually a predator's come in and that's their food source and they've eaten that so there's lots, I could, I could talk for hours on this um, alone, um, but encourage you to go and look at our website and, and look at some of the advice there on, on predators and how to look after the predators. Um, obviously predator friendly gardens, so thinking about what you're planting, um, predator friendly, pollinator friendly, similar thing really. There's a, I know that there's a, there's often a, an encouragement to have sort of nice formal gardens, lawns, nice neat edges, that sort of thing. Um, it's brilliant if you can just leave a little patch of grass to grow longer. Um, the whole no mow May thing is brilliant. Let's leave it longer than just May. Let's leave it longer than just the end of May and then you've got all that life in there and then cut it down again. Let's let's identify patches in our patches in our garden that actually that we can leave as a little wood pile brilliant absolutely brilliant for engage, for, for getting biodiversity um, into that space ponds as well can't underestimate the value of ponds and having just a small pond doesn't have to be a big pond i mean i um i should talk, i always talk about my my own back garden um We've got a relatively small back garden outskirts of Northampton um, and young kids, got a dog, we've got chickens. There's often a worry about having a pond. Just have a bucket, a small bucket, submerged, some rocks around it. And we have frogs visiting all the time. There's so much that you can actually you can do there. And um, it's simple, simple steps to take. Use resources responsibly. Obviously, that's a really topical one at the moment is water. Um, using water responsibly. Think about your water and water wisely. So using a hose and just right around the garden is wasteful. It's, it's, not, it's not a good use of that water resource. Try to collect water where you can. Um, obviously, it's been particularly dry the last few months. And so water butts probably are empty but use the water you have got wisely. Water around the base of the plant, little and, uh, and often, but, but it's really water the roots that need it. Don't water around, really water that soil and the roots around it. Um, energy, so thinking about the energy that you're using in the garden. Um, so that's, that's, we're talking about lawn mowers, um, that sort of thing. Can you use a, uh, a push mower instead, um, and sort of an old fashioned push mower? Um, really think sensibly. We've done a lot of um, also encouraging um, sort of groups of households uh, to actually, do, do they all need a piece of machinery, or actually, can you just buy one mach piece of machinery between the group of you and, and, and share it um, rather than the need for, for lots? Them. Um, plastics um, is a really it's a really contentious issue um, and we obviously we still have a lot of plant pots as gardeners you get you do inevitably get a lot of plant pots um, but there's a lot of recycling schemes now available that you can take them back to the garden centers and they will process them um, the challenge has always been the black plastic um, because of the optical recognition but there's there's a lot has changed now a lot has, and it is progressing for the, for the good um there's a whole other area around compostable plastics which i'm not going to really cover now but 
there's lots of advice on our website around that it's again it's a challenge it's a real challenge um but one to look out for one to consider obviously avoid using harmful chemicals like i said don't reach for the spray don't reach for the i, I mean i it's i, I talk about when you go into supermarkets and you see what I, what I define as the death cabinets um that that look awful and it's more often than not, you don't need it. You don't need it. There's there's roots away around it. There's organic roots around it without the need to reach for chemicals. And then just maintaining a healthy growing area. So thinking about crop rotation, thinking about moving what you're growing into different parts of the, the garden. Um, one of the best ways you could actually just mix plant, mix plant around your garden so you can have crops growing in amongst flowers and uh, ornamental and then good sanitation as well so so sort of cleaning tools properly always really help the good planning um is really really helpful and useful um to find out more um we've got loads on our website um loads and loads of advice and support there um We've obviously got our volunteer programs um, around the UK. Um, I'm really keen to try and establish more volunteer programs and really share these positive messages as, as, as much as we can. Um, I often talk about our volunteers are very much social butterflies. They they love to, it, it provides them with a platform. Being part of the network provides them with a platform to be able to go out into their local communities and really share these positive messages around the environment and just on a peer-to-peer -peer level. It's not being told you've got to do this, you've got to do that. It's a peer-to-peer -peer level being shown how to do something. Um, I've left my email address there, but I'm happy to open up to any questions as well. I'll stop sharing my screen so I can see you all again. Thank you um, for that presentation. That was really useful. One of the things we're keen on is being a leader in terms of what we're doing to look after the environment. And by having members on this session and able to engage with this information, they can then go out and disseminate it further amongst their communities, which I think is really useful. Um, and just quickly to make the point that for people who do want to share this, it'd be on YouTube um, so residents can engage with it as well. We've got some hands up. The first one I can see is Councillor Alabone. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, well, as you would expect me to make a comment here as a, as a cereal farmer all my life, um, some interesting points raised by Mr. Garrett, uh, but I thought there was a little bit of a sweeping statement about farmers continuously cropping and depleting all the, all the goodness in the soils. And he was right in saying that soil health is key, and it is key, which is why... Um, my farm business started back in the 1760s and we're still producing um, sustainable crops using as fewer chemicals and pesticides as we can. Um, I think a lot of farmers get stick for uh, a lot of the problems we see, uh, whether it's flooding or pollution or what have you. Uh, my own farm is a direct drilled farm. We went over about 14 years ago now. Uh, I farm 850 acres, over 700 is arable, and by not cultivating or cultivating only down to about two centimetres, we are sequestrating carbon, we're not releasing carbon into the atmosphere, we're increasing porosity so that it absorbs water better, mainly through the worm cast, because if you don't plough, you're not disturbing the worms. And uh, also by using uh, direct drills, you're not continually crossing the field getting compaction problems and, uh, and using huge amounts of diesel, which you're pumping sulfur into the atmosphere. We do test, and I think all farmers, all responsible farmers, test every four years for the obviously basics of uh, phosphate, potash and sulfur, which we need for crops. But there are a lot of trace minerals uh, that we also use, boron, molybdenum, copper, zinc, magnesium, they all have a part to play. And uh, finally, the point I would make about chemicals, we only use chemicals where it's absolutely necessary. And over the last 10 years, we've cut down um, hugely on what we what we actually do. 
you can um, get rid of chemicals if you want to try and do it fully organically by cultivation methods and you can get some GPS uh, equipment which will hoe between rows and things like that um, but certainly our chemical bill is a lot less than it used to be but we there are some chemicals that uh, we need such as glyphosate if we are going to use a direct drilling system which are essential and of course they've been used globally for about 40 years so some some interesting points there um, but also uh, I agree with the uh, the fact that we're using parts of our farm for nectar mix for pollinators. I think that's very important. 60% of our crops uh, are pollinated by bees. And, what, and uh, so we have a lot of nectar mix. We have wild bird mix. So I think um, certainly from my own perspective, that we are farming sustainably. We're using as, as fewer resources as we can, as fewer artificial chemicals. Um, we've cut down on fertilizer use. And again, agreeing with Mr. Garrett, the uh, organic matter in soils is important. And over the years, we have used biosolids, which is Anglia Waters sewage sludge, which is uh, heat treated to remove 99.8% of toxins and what have you, which otherwise, of course, used to be pumped out to sea. So I think we're doing it as responsibly as we, as we can. So some interesting points there. But, um, but please don't criticise all farmers as to think that we're ravishing the land for the short term gain. Thank you. Yeah, I, no, I completely agree with you, um, Mr. Alabone. Um, it, yeah, and it's looking at the, it's just important. I'm just trying to, I guess I'm just trying to emphasise the importance of our soils and, and, and actually caring for them because they are the thing that are, are easily forgotten. Thank you um, both for that. That was a useful insight, particularly from Councillor Alabone into to something you deal with on a daily basis. I'm going to hand over to Councillor Dell now. Thank you, Chair. And, and thank you, uh, Mr. Garrett, for your uh, excellent presentation there. I did notice in the presentation a couple of references to um, master composters. Um, Apologies, can't hear. Sorry. Very faint. Do you want to move on to someone else and I'll come back? Yep, no problem. So, um, Councillor Hatewell. I'm oh, sorry, I didn't mean to say I couldn't hear it, Des. Um, all very good, absolutely, and, and we do a lot of those things. One of the things we need to contemplate is that the tragic fire in Wennington was almost certainly caused by an overheating compost heat, which wiped out most of that village. Um, so whilst doing it at home is good, I think we need to have some very great care about compost heaps, equally heaps of um, wood. And equally, we have about half an acre, which we've just allowed to grow. And it's probably four or five feet high and dry as a bone and quite frightening when you see those things. So we absolutely, and, and there's another whole debate going on, Sometimes it's better to get that composting away from your homes than it is to be there. So I think fire service um, and um, some much better recognition of the risks is um, very worthwhile. And I think we need to build that into anything we do and any policies we have. I, yeah, I, I, I know that there's been a, a concern there. I mean, we're obviously, we've been aware of it as well. We're waiting on the there's not been a full fire service report as as of yet as i'm aware that there's been suggestions that the cause was the the compost heat but there's it's very it's incredibly unlikely for a small heap it, it has to be sort of a very large heap and to have got really high temperatures to, for it to have sort of been set from from that heat if, if you're maintaining a heat well then it should be moist and it, it should be if you've got that 50 percent greens 50 percent browns um it should be relatively moist and it's incredibly unlikely it, that a, a home compost heap um at the size that a home compost heap would be could spontaneously catch fire um, we've got advice um, that we can share on that, and and, and we do so um, in hot, hot weather periods around making sure that the, the heap is um, 
it has got plenty of um sort of water on it as well but it's i i'm i'm intrigued as well to hear hear more from the fire report from from this one because it's been very quick to suggest that it's the compost heap but it's i'd be interested to hear how big that heap was and and what whether there were any other external influences that could have impacted upon it i'm just reaching i've just come back it's absolutely categorical in the newspaper reports from the eyewitness of the person who had the compost heap that that's where it started and they attempted to put it out. But the other point is, with drought, we're not going to be spraying water on our compost heaps and equally keeping it moist in 30 degrees temperature. All I'm saying is not that you don't compost or there's anything negative about that, but with climate change, we really have to think about what we're storing in our gardens, particularly on the periphery of towns and villages where there could be very, very combustible items. So it's a question of thinking about it, not doing it. But absolutely, if you Google Wennington, you'll see the man who tried to put the fire out in the compost heap. Uh, and um, I don't think there's any question about it. No one has denied that. So we need to be aware of it, not to stop it, but we do need to be aware not to set it aside. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Hopewell. Councillor Dale, we'll come back to you. OK, thank you. I presume you oh, nod if you can hear me. That's much better. Lots of nodding. Excellent. Um, yeah, so thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Mr Garrett, for your presentation. I noticed during it there were a couple of references to master composters. I'm intrigued to find out a little bit more about that, as I believe um, there was a programme run a few years ago. One of the more long-standing councillors may be able to confirm that. Um, if there was a master composting program put on by the council, I'm just wanting to learn a bit more about him for that. Thank you. Yeah, there was indeed for a short period of time. Um, we um, we worked with obviously Northamptonshire County Council at the time um, with the, the waste team there. It was a so we uh, my, I'll explain a little bit more about the master compost program. So um, as I said, we we recruit trained support volunteers who go out into local communities. We're typically um, commissioned by local authorities or waste service providers um, to do that. Um, in uh, most of our larger programs, we recruit a member of staff locally who then um, oversees that program. They are fully responsible for recruiting, training, supporting those volunteers with the support of our wider team um, across the UK. In this instance, um, with Northamptonshire County Council a few years back, we um, delivered a lesser funded programme um, in which the coordination, we were providing secondary support to a um, local officer employed by directly by the council. Um, the, the challenges um, around that come about when um, time capacity um, comes into question. We always suggest at least two days a week to make a really effective programme work. Um, and so we've got experience of doing those. Um, I mean, with the, the Master Composter um, programme is a garden organic programme. It's, um, it's something that we have been delivering in the UK for more than 20 years now. Um, we've got a lot, we've, we do a lot of training for, um, as well as for volunteers, we do a lot of training for um, waste service providers, for, for staff, um, CPD training around composting. And so um, it's a lot around that knowledge sharing aspect. I'd love to set up a new programme um, in Northampton, North Northamptonshire. <laughs> Well, that's certainly something I'm sure we'll we'll look at um, in in detail as we move forward with this. Um, Councillor Watt. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, David. So that was a very comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, my my own personal viewpoint is that we should be encouraging our residents and, and uh, showing our residents the benefits of home composting. Uh, in my view, it's better to. Uh, compost it at home than it is to put it in a, a 40 ton lorry and, and use spend all that diesel co2 transporting it halfway across the the county god knows actually where it actually goes to um so yeah i think we should be uh, encouraging uh the and showing people the benefits um the green waste review did throw up an option of maybe a 40 pound charge 
Uh, if you actually home compost, you probably save yourself forty pounds in compost per year. So you're actually you're actually uh, you got an eighty pound saving annually, which I think is something for us to uh, to promote uh, and uh, encourage. Um, I totally agree with the soil health. Uh, we're in Corby. We've got naturally a poor soil health here, very clay. Uh, and it needs a lot of organic matter in it to, to break it up and feed for your plants. And, and what a better to to do that with uh, what nature just gives to you. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm fully in favour of it all. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Watt. Councillor Hallam. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, education, as always, has a huge part to play in this and I know it was a long while ago but I think think back to when I was at school um, we had a greenhouse and a garden area and we all we all went through the basics and we all grew stuff and thought nothing of it and did the same at home when we got home and in those earlier days as well I remember at home the whole of the back garden apart from a very small area was used for growing stuff on and also we had an allotment uh, and so on so you know I think somehow schools seem to have gone away from that that in their curriculum generally. I'm sure there's exceptions, um, but we need to get uh, we get this back into the schools and get people uh, thinking about growing and and what they do. In terms of composting, I'm I'm sold. I've got five compost heaps and very proud of them. <laughs> right, so uh, thank you for uh, the content. But I think education is is very important. Brilliant. Yeah, absolutely, completely agree. And. Um... I often um, refer to a bit of a skills gap um, where, like you say, um, it was sort of passed on. It was a skill sort of gardening, composting was a skill sort of passed on. But I guess there's a period where it hasn't necessarily been passed on. And, um, and so the confidence in using that skill goes. And, and I mean, if you ever ask a gardener, how good they are at gardening it's all well oh I don't know I'm not sure there's a very sort of shy sort of um, bunch to talk about how how great they are at their garden you go and see their garden it's absolutely brilliant um but um I, I agree in terms of the school setting we do a lot of work um with schools not necessarily with the children but with the teachers to to sort of teach them the school staff in general to, to give them the confidence to, to use horticulture in what they're in their teaching in what they're doing and that's that's partly what it comes down to it's that confidence because they don't want to feel like if they don't fully know what they're doing around growing they're less likely to use it in what in their teaching um and so trying to give them the confidence and then we've i mean we've also we've recognized that there's there's challenges in that there's challenges of making time available for staff for school staff to go on courses so we've developed online learning options, um, webinars, but also a Moodle platform that we use to share that message and we tailor support so that it's really feeding into lesson plans and curriculums and, uh, and that sort of thing so that it's there, it's there for those teachers so that it's giving them that best possible opportunity to use that, that advice and support within their teaching. Thank you, Councillor Jenny. Well, thank you. It's, uh, it's really interesting. Um, I do have a reasonable sized compost heap, but I'm afraid I tend to throw things on there and then assume that they will, the compost will look after itself. But um, I will think about it a lot more carefully now than I did before. Uh, what I really wanted to ask, I believe you mentioned at the beginning uh, about comfrey uh, and how that can be used. I wonder, I think I probably missed what you said. Um, are you able to repeat? Yeah, so um, comfrey, uh, what you're looking for is bocking 14. So bocking 14 is a variety that doesn't um, seed and spread. But once you've planted it, it's there for good. Um, so make sure you plant it in the right place. Where you, where you want to use it and um, really really deep tap roots that go deep down into the ground and they bring these really useful nutrients up into the leaves um, and those, those leaves you can harvest them two or three times a year you could add them to a compost heap and it becomes a um, it's an it's a, an activator so it can help to speed up the compost process 
You can also press the leaves and take that, that, that liquid and then dilute it um, and feed it to the plants directly. Um, or you could use a um, put it as, use it as a liquid feed, essentially, put it into a compost press and um, and add water um, into water, but that sort of thing. So it's a, it's a really good natural liquid feed, um, negating the need to buy um, tomato feeds, for example. Um, you could feed your feed your tomatoes um, using the country liquid. Okay, thank you very much for that. That's helpful. Someone also said I think saw some, some pop up about medicinal properties. Yes, absolutely. There's some really good um if you look at Lawrence Hill's um book. Um and um yeah, there's lots there's lots there around medicinal uses of, um as well. Thank you. Great, thank you. I can't see any of the hands up. Um I thought that was a, a really useful insight into what we can all be doing as individuals um in our gardens and of varying types and sizes to to help look after the our small patch within our back gardens but also having that wider impact as well and it will be important moving forward for us to look at the ways that we can spread that information further and enable more people across our community to start taking those small steps and I noticed you talked about the having the mini ponds perhaps just even a bucket but and that looks after um wildlife such as frogs etc but it also helps um, other animals such as hedgehogs as well giving them a place to drink from um, particularly in the warmer weather so there are lots of small things that that go on to have a bigger impact and and we will be able to to look at ways we can spread that further um, perhaps through our website etc so thank you everyone for joining there um, as I said please do share this wider with your communities and networks um, what we're going to do now, we will move on to the more substantive items of our EAP meeting. So I will give people the opportunity to um, come off the call if they're um, wanting to. You can probably stop and listen uh, as you can with the, any other of these meetings, but we'll move on to the, the actual EAP meeting um, now. But thank you for your attendance. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Am I okay to stay on, Harriet? Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, what we do, we have a, a number of members of the EAP and they'll be able to contribute um, as normal. But anybody who just fancies stopping to, to listen and watch um, is welcome to do so. But We'll just ask them to politely keep on mute. Okay, so I think most people um, have left where where they wanted to. The format of these meetings is really good because it's all on YouTube, so people can engage with it in their own time um, as well if they if they can't now. Um, so I'm going to hand over to. Um, I I believe I'm just checking my screen, Brian, um, to take us through the um, tree management and care policy. Hopefully I've got that correct. It, it, it's actually myself, Chair, oh, first, if that's sorry, okay. <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. It's fine. I will, I will, I will um, allow Brian to, 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 um, to come in and pick anything up, though, that, that I can't cover. But I was going to shortly introduce the paper, if that's okay. Fantastic. Thank you. So the, the first paper that, that we're presenting today is the tree management and care policy. Um, so as you'll all be aware, uh, as a council, as a major landowner and highway authority, uh, we're responsible for thousands of trees across our patch. And, and we also have a legal duty to ensure those trees are managed in a safe way. Combined with that, we've also got the ability to utilise those thousands of trees and wider green space to enhance the environment for residents and importantly, support climate change mitigation and biodiversity improvement. So following the presentation to the EAP last year, which I'm sure many of you will, will remember, on the Council's tree stock, um, a tree management working group was established with representatives from teams across the Council uh, that look after trees. And the main purpose of that group was to share best practice across the authority to provide a consistent approach to managing trees. That work's culminated in the policy document before you, uh, and that aims to set out a consistent standard for the care and management of trees on land owned by the council. 
just one second, there's a problem with my computer. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, sorry, there seems to be a problem with my camera at the moment, but I'll, I'll keep going. So the policy that's in front of you is split over six key themes, as, as you'll be able to see. Uh, and we've also set out a number of steps uh, promoting and sharing the tree policy uh, that we want to develop as an action plan going forward. Um, I suppose the policy is just the first step on the journey to preparing what would be a comprehensive tree, tree strategy uh, that will look to build on these actions. Um, and as mentioned, I'm joined by Brian, who um, led the internal working group uh, in terms of pulling together this policy. Uh, I'm, I'm sure between us uh, together, we'll be able to answer any questions and provide any further detail on the paper chair. So happy to take any questions. Thank you, Jonathan. So th this is an important step forward in terms of bringing together the work that the um, previous sovereign authorities have done. Um, and as members of the EAP will see, there's a number of sp the specific policies as Jonathan's spoken through, talked through there. What we'll look to do in the future is to expand on this into a, a wider strategy to make sure we're we're really looking after our tree population in North Northamptonshire and allowing it to flourish further. So I can see hands have gone up. We've got Councillor Watt first. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Jonathan. Yeah, I was really pleased to read the this uh, policy strategy document. Uh, what I'm really key, keen to hear of is an expansion a plant, a planting policy, uh, identifying um, uh, uh, patches of land, areas of land that we may not need for, we can't develop and planting trees on them. Uh, and also planting more neighborhood trees, urban trees. Uh, it's recognized and known that uh, tree canopies actually lower the temperature uh, in, in, this, in the summer, the beneficial, um, and they do three things. They, they lower the temperature, they filter, and they sequest uh, CO2. So uh, although we can't um, plant our way out of climate change, uh, it, it does, it's a part that helps it. So I, I'm hoping that we can identify patches, pockets of land, uh, maybe even larger tracts of land that we can, um, we can plant up uh, and really um, because trees bring height, they bring uh, quality to a landscape. So yeah, that's what I'm looking for. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Watt. And I know officers will be able to, to speak about this a little bit more. That's certainly on the radar. A number of other authorities have gone into great detail in terms of looking at land um, and where trees would be suitable and particularly the types of trees going into further detail on that. And I'm keen that we... Um, we move forward with that as well. And it'd be, it was something I found out a few days ago um, was that when rows of terrace houses were built, for example, um, they ha each had a fruit tree in their back gardens, um, which are looking to the future, could we, we work with developers um, in relation to something similar? So would the office- totally agree with you on that one, Harriet. Um, actually, I think we should just plant fruit trees on our grass verges, let the fruit grow. So I'm gonna I'm gonna hand over to the officers if they want to add something on there. I, I, I'm happy to come in initially. Then 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 of course Brian, if you want to, uh, please please do chip in. The the I suppose initially um, in terms of large scale tree planting, it, it, it would be fantastic for us to look to do that either looking to identify sites that we already have or indeed um, um, uh, you know whether there is an opportunity to expand perhaps one of our existing sites. Uh, that's certainly something that that you know is an aspiration of whether we can do obviously within within financial reason in terms of building that in. But we have uh, just submitted um, an expression of interest to the Woodland Accelerator uh, Fund, which looks to give um, grants to councils to um, employ uh, resource staff to to go out and deliver tree planting locally so working you know public sector but also private sector so that's something we have put an expression of interest in and, and I, I can't recall off the top of my head the time scale so when we'll know if we've been successful or not but that's something, certainly something we're pursuing and that will also help give us funding to to map out our own land ownership in terms of what we do have 
and where some of those opportunities are. I think it's also worth just noting that it's not just about expanding the tree stock, it's about making sure the existing tree stock we've got is looked after properly and has the opportunity to, uh, you know, to grow and, and, and expand that tree coverage as well. So it's, 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 whilst tree planting is important, it's also important that we balance that. But um, Brian, I'll, I'll stop talking and let, let, let you come in. <laughs> No, no, thanks. It's, um, yeah, it's exactly as Jonathan said, um, you know, there tends to be a huge focus on tree planting, but, you know, um, tree planting is only one part of a very complex picture. And, um, you know, as, as officers and tree managers, we need to consider this, you know, alongside protection, care, and the management of, of our existing trees. Um, this would be the first document that we produced principally because we saw it was vital straight away to get some consistency of approach across um, all the uh, legacy authorities so that we're all providing the same sort of standard of care, same response to the public um, on all matters, trees, whether it be private trees or public trees that we own. Um, the officer group fully intend um, for this to be part of us. When we say a strategy, we mean a real strategic overview of the whole of um, our tree cover throughout North North Ants. Um, part of the strategy will include, you know, very, very specific management action plans. And obviously it will commit to the planting of new trees and we'll have canopy cover targets. And, um, you know, areas, looking at areas where we can increase tree planting, where we can look at creating new orchards, where we can create new fruit tree planting, these are all part of what we intend to be a strategy. I try and think of, you know, a tree strategy really is, you know, you, you sort of need to know where you are. And we're still at the moment in the process of trying to understand where we are and what we've got and the responsibilities and then where we want to go. And our strategy will drive us from A to B. And we, we may never get there, but at least it will take us on the way and it will give us proper targets, manageable targets. It will support the officers to do this. Um, we want it to um, ensure that we've got very, very good standards for planting and aftercare. Um, we want it to make sure that it's linked to all our other relevant strategies, um, you know, open space strategies, pollinator strategies, biodiversity, transport, climate change, you know, even drainage. Um, initially, we see that this will be possibly something that will be a five-year plan, maybe 10-year plan, but it's something that we would want to bring back um, to members um, for comment and to let members know how we're getting on. The other thing about a, a strategy like this is that I see it as being part of our planning policy. If adopted, it would become part of our, you know, um, uh, 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 one of our planning documents. And so we would have supplementary planning documents for trees on new developments. For instance, we could uh, encourage planting of fruit trees within individual gardens. Um, but once it's adopted, then it certainly uh, adds a lot more weight to all the good work that we want to do. And I think finally, one thing that when I got involved in this, I was very clear to, to Jonathan and, and other senior managers that I don't want this to be a mission statement. I want it to be something that actually results in, in real action on the ground. Absolutely, thank you for that. I'm going to hand over to Councillor Buckingham. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm sorry I haven't got a picture, but don't worry, it, it won't affect anything. Um, but my internet is quite low, so um, you'd be better off without a picture. I have a couple of um, bits that I want to um, raise with you. Um, policy TP3 um, gives one tree replacement for every tree removed. Um, and I don't think that um, that particular one, one for one, because you're not getting like for like, you might have a hundred year old tree uh, that might need to come down because of um, disease or whatever um, but what are you going to replace it with so I'd like something on size and um, age of replacements coming in 
Um, and I think there needs to be more of a, um, a 10 for one uh, replacement if they're going to be small, because you, you've almost got to replace that um, carbon capture um, right from the beginning and, and, you know, it'll unbalance it. So I'd like some thought to be given to that. Um, policy TP7 um, doesn't appear to be strong enough. So we're talking about what we can do as landowners, but how can we encourage more partnership working, working with um, farmers, other landowners, planners, um, as been said before, um, you know, to strengthen what our beliefs are, what are how how we should um, manage things. The other thing that I have a real problem with and um, comes from my time in, living in Australia is that um, management of, for example, we've had uh, a, an extraordinary um, position where we have started to have wild wildfires now. My biggest problem is, is um, that we make sure that either the, the, the floor of the woodlands or, or whatever is maintained to a certain level where you can encourage your pollinators and you know, your overwintering uh, pollinators and things like that. But at the same time, it's not a tinder tinder hearth for wildfires and, and how devastating those can be. So I think it's it it needs to have a little more bit more thought on that part of things. Um, hang on, I've got some other bits. Uh, polluters. Um, we're not the what the document doesn't do is is think about the polluters that um, have an impact on our our woodland. So the microplastics that are within our atmosphere, we're not sort of uh, looking at capturing any data on that. And I think we need to start looking at what polluters, what diseases, what other things can affect. So we're looking at what we as, as people can do, but we also need to look at our ecosystems and what's happening within them to help manage the process. That's all I'm going to say. I probably talked too much, but thank you. No, not at all. And it, it's we like to have this input. That's what we have these meetings for. So thank you for those. I know that officers are going to be able to answer questions on the points you've raised. Um, I, I think in just if I can chip in on, on TP3, um, we're keen that it says at least one replacement tree will be planted um, to, to be able to give us that flexibility to do what is right in the circumstances. Um, and I'm sure that officers will be looking at where there are those circumstances where, for example, an, an older, a more mature tree had to come down, they would be looking at how they're replacing that and making sure that it is right for the, the environment. Um, on the other points you made, Jonathan earlier talked about the local nature recovery strategy, and that will be really important in terms of um, encouraging biodiversity to, to um, re-establish itself in certain places and, and um, flourish further. And that will be important in terms of working with different partners to make sure that we're maximising the potential of that. Um, I'll hand over to officers now because I'm sure they'll be able to add to the comments there. Brian, I think you're on Brian, mute. I'm afraid. Brian, you're on, you're on mute, but I'm happy if you if you want to start off, Brian, and I can chip in a couple of bits. Yeah, just want to say um, thank you very much um, for the comments. Um, as Councillor Pentland mentioned, we the TP3 was the one policy that got the most comments in the officer group. 
And, um, you know, we ended up looking at how we could make sure that it's not going to cause us any issues in the future, not going to commit us to something that, that we're not going to be able to, to deliver, um, but also align with any other um, policies. And we felt that the most sensible way to word it was to say at least one tree um, for exactly those reasons, to give us the flexibility um, to be able to um, plant the right tree and the right trees in the right places. So, for instance, if we if we were to lose, you know, a, a large mature tree, we could, in theory, replace it with a group of trees or a, a small woodland. So that that was the the idea with that. It's very tricky trying to write some of these very specific policies. Um, and you mentioned about TP7. Uh, a lot of this is um, work to support the officers and the work that they're already doing. Um, and uh, certainly part of my role and the other officers who work in planning roles is to develop relationships with large landowners, with the town and parish councils, so that we make sure that we're never in a situation where they're not going to be planting trees. And I can only really speak from my own personal experience, but all of the town and parish councils that I work with in the former East area, all very, very keen and all want to increase their tree coverage. So um, a lot of this is really down to the way we work as officers and developing those relationships um, with our, our landowners and other organisations. Um, to do with the question um, about the impact of that sort of climate change and pollutants, that sort of thing, um, we need to make sure we're not hamstrung by the tree species that we use. We, we need to be able to respond certainly to climate change. And at the moment, um, the uh, former sovereign authorities have got various different um, tree management policies, tree planting policies, lists of tree species. And these are all things that we're going to have to take um, a fresh look at as part of our tree, tree strategy to make sure that we're responding to, to all of this change that, that's happening. Thank you. Um, Councillor Dell. Thank you, Chair, and um, thanks guys for this document. It's really good. Um, again, I was, I was going to mention TP3, which um, I think you've already covered. Um, I do know that other councils have ascertained a scale for the number of trees equivalent from the circumference size um, of the tree that's taken out, but I think you've covered that already. Um, regarding, I'm not sure which section this is, but there's a section that says this, the council will seek compensation from any organisation responsible for significant damage to or removal of any council owned trees to the value as calculated by CAVAT, which is Capital Asset Valuation of Amenity Trees. That says organisation. Um, could, could that possibly also say individual um, as I'm aware that there are um, I've had a couple of instances since becoming a, a councillor of individuals who have um, who are not keen on having trees outside their houses and have actually taken matters into their own hands um, I'm aware of one recently that because uh, that's obviously that's criminal damage um, I'm aware of one recently that um, I think the, there's been a prosecution or it's, it's ongoing but I want to talk talk too much about it but um, It'd be really good to have something that, and i think a lot of this this is a side point but comes down to education if we because we, we do get certain times of the year i've got a street with a lot of lime trees and they drops a lot of stuff onto people's houses and we I get a lot of emails about that and i think a lot of it is about education you know the benefits of street trees especially as you said earlier the shade and um, the co2 sequestering 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 um <laughs> and all of that kind of thing i think a lot of people aren't aware of that and so they would maybe think better of their street trees um, as opposed to thinking them of a pain uh, at, at certain points of the year um, so it's really nice to see uh, streets with street trees to sort of have like a, um, a people educated about the benefits of them and you know because they are essential um, I've got a couple of other comments TP7 we mentioned earlier the landowner should be encouraged that would be nice to have that a little bit stronger um, TP14 the council will only fail remove trees for sound agricultural reasons including dead dying or dangerous um, dangerous obviously um, but dead or dying because um, dead trees can be a hive of insect activity wildlife activity um, if, is that something that depending on the circumstances could be adjusted because um, obviously as long as it's not dangerous then to keep some dead trees, you know, you know, there lots of wildlife use those trees. Um, 
And then there was another point about TP15. I'm really pleased to see TP15 because obviously, as I've just mentioned, uh, the pruning or removal of trees will not, uh, th this will not constitute grounds, which is obviously problems associated with fruit or pollen or, you know, stuff like that. So it's those people that um, are, do like not, aren't keen on the street trees that were there for maybe a hundred years before they moved in. Um, but uh, the bit about uh, inf interference with um, reception telephone cables. So telephone cables, especially I know with tree branches can be affected. Would that then fall to BT or the provider? Um, and how would that get around that issue if it's not a council responsibility? Um, and then there was one more point. Uh, yes, um, the tree planting, love, love a lot of tree planting. Um, we're, there was a whole load of tree planting for the Jubilee, um, including, uh, well, uh, and we, I'm often involved in getting the tree packs from the uh, Woodland Trust and um, getting out there and planting a load of trees. Of course, without the due aftercare, um, so many of those whips have just succumbed to the heat and the dry. Um, so obviously aftercare is a huge, huge importance. But also um, one of the tree plantings we were involved in, um, and I think Harriet, you came along to that one in Kettering, um, there was actually some works, cable works, and um, the contractors dug straight through where the trees were planted. Um, so obviously some more communication like that would be useful. Although with the heat we've had recently, I'm not sure how many of them would have survived anyway, with the survivability of whips being not the best. Um, and again, there's something about here, uh, engaging more with the community, um, and especially with tree planting, you know, getting it, because you can't just, we, we run an event, get people to plant trees, and then that's it, because they need like at least three years of aftercare. And I think a lot needs to be thought about bringing the community on board. Um, I believe there might be issues with disease, but if we thought about like providing trees to community groups or schools to look after, until they're strong enough to go out into the uh, into the wild, <laughs> into um, <laughs> released into the wild, the trees, uh, but to be planted somewhere properly, um, you know, because it gives people ownership over those trees, and then they can care for them in the in the wild. Uh, that's my point. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dow. A number of technical points there that officers will be best placed to answer. So I'm going to hand over to whoever wants to answer those bits. I'm happy to um, to try and answer those. Um, and thank you, Councillor Dell, for uh, comments. Um, as officers, you'll probably know all this yourself. When you write something initially, you can only have it proofread so many times. And, and this must have been proofread by about twenty people already, and no one spotted about the organisation uh, and not having an individual in there. So thank you for that. Um, maybe that's my planning head coming on, where I do tend to deal more with larger organisations when it comes to. Um, the trees being damaged. Um, so yeah, we can certainly uh, make that change. Um, I think some of the other comments were about uh, the dead, dying and dangerous trees, the TP14. Again, it's, um, it's, it's, it's very difficult to try and write a, a, a policy that doesn't commit officers or doesn't leave officers open um, to not only criticism, but acting um, uh, and in Hawaii, which used the term arboricultural standards, we don't want to remove any trees that don't need to be removed. We definitely do want to keep standing timber where it's going to be beneficial. Um, the, the tree strategy deals with street trees, trees in parks and open spaces, um, you know, shelter belts adjacent to roads, um, it deals with woodlands. It, it kind of has to deal, like say, whips. It includes hedgerows, trees and hedgerows. It, it kind of has to, try, these policies kind of have to be everything to everyone. So I think maybe TP14 was probably structured more to do with sort of street trees, trees in parks, where there's a high public um, access areas. Um, so I'm pretty sure, I, yeah, I think I need to look at that a little bit more just to include something along the lines of um you know where the risk is low then we would seek to retain standing timber standing deadwood um certainly within the woodland areas so i think that's certainly an addition that we can make and we should have made so thank you for that one um 
Uh, I'm trying to think. There's also something about tree planting and um, public, and also um, about having young trees um, being grown on. I think a lot of these things would form part of um, the guiding documents within a wider tree strategy. This to say is it just an initial policy, really, just to provide that consistency for tree management and care across the across the new council just to make sure that we're going away from all these slightly separate um, different standards of care and policy that we had so um, um, i think what would be really useful is maybe um, maybe even have some uh, member working groups if, if that's i'm maybe going a little bit overboard recommending that um, just to have a look at what um, what what the officers consider should be within the tree strategy and also what the members would like to be in the tree strategy. I'm not sure what the mechanism for this is, whether we invite members to join the tree management working group um, or whether we have one um, separate special tree management working group meeting where members could come along. I don't know if that's an idea. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and, and I was just, just mentioning that it, it might be useful. One of the things I very much want is, um, you know, we'd like champions. Um, I'd very much like, you know, a senior member, um, uh, a senior councillor to be very supportive of the work we're doing, but also like a, a senior, you know, a, executive officer to support the work we're doing. So um, I think what I was saying was it may be useful as a tree management working group. We're at the stage now. Uh, where if we can get this um, first document adopted, we really then need to look at the wider strategy. And, and that would be a lot of guidance documents. And I think this is where we'd look at things like species selection um, and any other smaller projects, like providing um, whether we could do some sort of grant scheme for trees, whether we could encourage um, trees to be grown on, as Councillor Dell was suggesting. So I think a great opportunity for that would be to invite members, uh, those that are interested, to come along to one of the tree management working groups. So we could talk and have a workshop, I think would be a, a, a good idea. I'd certainly value that. And I think the members of the tree management group would. Um, we all, in some ways, kind of work in little silos. This is very much a cross-cutting piece of work across uh, you know, departments, and sort of directorates across the council. So um, if, yeah, well, I'd like to make that, that, that offer if that's of interest to members. Chair, Thank you. If, you, if, you, if you're happy, I can come in on a couple of other points that, that Councillor, Councillor Dell made um, in yep. terms of the, the um, tree planting and aftercare, uh, and in particular, where we've had requests to plant trees uh, recently as part of the, um, the Queen's Green uh, canopy initiative and, and we've been really keen as part of that and, and whilst it hasn't always been well received that where we do get requests uh, for planting on our land that, that they're documented properly such that the aftercare continues beyond the initial planting and to make sure that you know uh, the trees have the best opportunity of of growing into maturity and being looked after so we have tried to pick that up as part of the, the current proposals. I, I think a lot of the a lot of the, the points and 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 the the detail in terms of behind your question, which is really welcome. I think we can either pick up as part of uh, the policy development, as Brian says, or indeed as part of the management plan development for individual areas. Because one thing this this uh, policy will allow us to do is to to then put in place management plans where we don't already have them um, across across North North Ants in a consistent way, and that's really the next step of the working group. And I think in terms of, of getting that, that further member buy-in that, that um, Brian alluded to, it's certainly something we, we can bring back to this forum, um, hopefully with, with, you know, you know, with, with Harriet's support in terms of um, taking forward the development of that strategy and obviously the community involvement. Great, thank you. Apologies earlier, Brian, it's the joys of Zoom. You're never quite sure whether someone's just finished or not. Um, but this getting the tree strategy work right and the the wider basis of this will be really important and having that engagement is a key aspect of that so we'll certainly look at how we bring that to the right forums and get the right people involved with that I'm going to hand over to councillor alabone now 
Thank you, Madam Chairman. Just a quick query. I did read in the, in the report about uh, trying to minimise the number of insurance claims. So I think it was, uh, I haven't got it printed up here, but I've got a meta note. I think it was 4.4, so whether that was the paragraph. And I just wondered how many insurance claims we, we tend to get. Uh, presumably this is if, if bows fall on either a person or a car or property. And it follows on from an issue I've been following up with a resident about the lack of benches, public benches in Bassett's Park. Uh, there's a tarmac path from top to bottom, a tree lined avenue. And there used to be a lot of benches there. And I can only assume it's uh, they've been removed permanently because of health and safety, which does seem to be rather self-defeating because if public can't enjoy the benefits of enjoying the shade of, of a tree on warm days. Um, it's nice to sort of look at them, but only from a distance. And I just wondered, is this a, a serious problem with insurance claims on uh, dangerous or what tr trees could be considered as dangerous or not? Jonathan, I can see you've come off mute. Yeah, no, no. I, I mean, I... Off the top of my head, I can tell you how many insurance claims the council um, has each year, although we, we, we can look into that if, if, if you'd like that figure, Councillor Alabone. I, I suppose it, it, it is an issue um, often with um, more mature trees that perhaps have not been planted in what we would now consider to be um, the right location for that tree. Uh, and obviously then there's a there's a choice between taking the tree out versus any any damage to the building and in those circumstances obviously we, we have a liability and we have to manage that and unfortunately it often results in the in the tree being removed albeit it is perhaps in the wrong location so so that those instances do happen um, unfortunately where there's damage to property but I, I'm certainly happy to, to get a, a statistic in terms of number of insurance claims we do receive as a council. Thank you. I can um, just add, but um, one of the main reasons to put this in is, um, I think um, Councillor Watt mentioned earlier, we've got a high level of uh, clay soils in the area, and we get um, a lot of enquiries, um, some of them which develop into insurance claims for subsidence where the clay soil shrinks, and in certain circumstances the tree can drive this and so the trees get involved in alleged subsidence claims which can become very time consuming um, and um, very unpleasant for residents whose houses are moving um, with an insurance uh, claim that doesn't get settled sometimes for you know four or five years so um, we want to try and reduce that um, as part of uh, this tree strategy and why we do that is by having strategic management of trees by knowing what trees we've got, where, what age they are, what condition they're in, so that we can manage them proactively, properly. Um, I think at the moment, some of our handling of tree root claims uh, could be improved upon, and um, the Tree Management Working Group are working with Council's insurance team and are looking at developing with our council's GIS team hotspots. So for instance, we will just produce maps which show where all the issues are with uh, tree root claims so that we can then tailor our tree management in those areas to, to reduce the claims. Thank you for that. Thank you. Councillor Watt. Thank you, Chair. That's my second bite of the cherry. Um, uh, I'll start off with uh, my disappointment. Uh, not with NCC, but it was with the previous uh, Corby Borough Council. Um, there was a number of mature trees were taken down uh, in West Glebe, uh, poplars, um, and uh, they weren't dead, diseased or dying um, because we could see the the the, uh, the trunks of the trees as they were all lined up. Uh, and there was no disease in them. So I'm hoping that with this policy, uh, we'll do proper analysis of a tree because those were 50, 50 year mature poplars. And as uh, Des, as uh, Lynn has said, there's a lot of biodiversity contained within, uh, within those trees. And it's really disappointing. Um, um, I did comment at the time to the Borough Council and some members defense where they planted a lot of trees and as Dell and Lynn have said there were tree whips uh they sort of claim of about 5,000 tree whips were sold were planted we'd probably taken 100,000 tree whips to replace the, the amount of uh, uh poplars that were taken out um Tower Hill 
a lovely stand of um, poplars. Admittedly, there was some uh, some disease in the centre of those poplars, but they didn't uh, pose a, a danger to anybody. So that's my complaint over. Um, um, I think uh, Des uh, alluded to some uh, residents complained about tree uh, leaves leaf fall. And that um, well, I think. Uh, back, going back to the, the composting, we should sell the benefits of collecting all those leaves that are in the trees, uh, that are on, on the streets, put them in bags, put them at the bottom bee garden for a year or two, and then you've got fantastic leaf mulch. Um, so and then I have one question uh, about our, we do do street cleaning and we collect uh, leaf mulch. We have, we benefit from the uh, the Lloyds area in Corby of having a lot of street trees. Um, consequently, we have a lot of leaf drop in the uh, in the winter. It would be nice to know that all that le that leaf mulch that is collected by the street cleaners doesn't actually just go into landfill. And uh, last uh, uh, on the subject of tree roots. Uh, are we going to uh, recommend pollarding rather than removal of trees as well? Because it would be best if we could just do a winter pollard, contain contain the tree and hopefully retain it. And on uh, two last points, um, perhaps we could have a, a policy of uh, resident contribution to trees where they could uh, contribute some money and have the name on a tree. And hopefully it will continue on with some kind of placard on there. Uh, and then the other one would be, uh, there's a number of companies on the internet who sell um, CO2 sequestration via trees. Is it possible that we could do the same thing in North Northamptonshire uh, to uh, bring in funds for, uh, for more trees? Thank you. Thank you for that. And you've raised a number of points there. I know that the aspects of that are already being being looked at. Um, I don't know if officers want to comment on any of those bits. I'm, I'm happy to start, Chair, although uh, Brian may need to pick up the more technical ones around pollarding, etc. But in terms of the question around street cleansing and um, collecting leaf mulch, etc. I'm, I'm aware the grounds team um, do work closely with them and they are looking at uh, ways that they can improve this area, although I'm not aware they're doing it and um, currently, although I, I could be wrong and that they are trialling some of these, but uh, I know it is being looked at. So perhaps if I give uh, Council Bott an update on that separately. But in terms of the point around selling um, a carbon offsetting to private companies, particularly with um, uh, the um, biodiversity net gain rules coming in in relation to planning applications, we are expecting an uptake in inquiries about those sorts of um, requests. And clearly there is an opportunity there uh, for commercial landowners, but also uh, public landowners around uh, being able to bring in funds by seeing investment in some of our open space where we can plant trees uh, correctly. So that is something we are considering and would feed into the work we're doing around identifying sites or locations where we could actually uh, increase tree planting. But I'll hand over to Brian for the other questions. Uh, yeah. I think the question uh, about pollarding, certainly um, for tree management, uh, street tree management or management of trees in uh, some of the areas, I think they were probably built by development corporations where there were many trees were planted close to um, fairly high density accommodation. Um, we would look to manage the trees um, uh, for the benefits, we wouldn't want to do something like carrying out very harmful pruning that would result in leaving quite ugly looking trees that require high maintenance in the long term. Um, pollarding specifically is a term, I think it's more of a methodology of tree management, and sometimes it's um, uh, misused the term. I think of it more as you train a young tree to a shape and a size, and then you regularly prune it, a bit like you know, rose tree pruning, or a spallier, that sort of thing. So um, taking large branches off a mature tree wouldn't be classed as pollarding. And in response to reducing the water uptake of the tree, sometimes carrying out harsh pruning, um, sometimes makes the situation worse. The, the tree just tries harder to respond to the 
physiological stress that's been imposed upon it. But I uh, just want to sort of reassure members that every individual sort of insurance claim or every time we put on notice that there's an alleged case of tree subsidence, uh, tree driven subsidence by clay soil shrinkage, we look at everything to do with that individual claim, all of the evidence that come in the soil testing, uh, the desiccation, um, you know, the monitoring of the buildings. So um, officers, you know, of, of course, deal with each and every one on its merits. Great, thank you. Um, Councillor O'Hara. Thank you, Chair. Um, very interesting conversation. Um, I, I'm referring back really to where we started in terms of uh, getting this policy within planning policy, because I think it's imperative. Um, we've got so many SUEs that have been built, so many estates that are privately managed that aren't adopted, um, can't be adopted by the council. Um, and within those areas, there's open spaces. And we see now and again, those open spaces coming back to be developed when in actual fact, they'd be far better being planted. We, we have planted a lot of trees, but that's to mitigate against flooding because obviously the, they'll take up the water to some extent. Um, and I agree with what's just been said about how we can't cut mature trees. I mean, I'm surrounded by mature trees at the minute. And a lot of them, we've had a few come down because the, the, the amount of, there's just not enough water, especially if they've got fruit on, they, they, they're just too heavy and the branches are breaking because they're drying out. Um, so I think, you know, this care of the trees and, and knowing how to care for them is imperative. And, and, and I think it's something that we could educate everybody on, you know, all our residents. Um, because a lot of people, you know, will plant a tree and they plant it too close to the house and they get problems themselves then with as subsidence or, or trees uprooting or, or going underneath the foundations of the house. So I think I, I would very much like to be involved if there is going to be some kind of working party, working group to, to look at the trees and look at our policy and then to put this forward to the executive to have this part of planning policy so that this item could go to planning policy for them to look at it and to adopt it. And that would then help within our planning um, and also inform any future developments and actually whether that could be done and I'm kind of looking to George for this, whether that could be done retrospectively to say, you know, we need these trees, not just because it makes the area nice and it's good for um, the, the planet, etc. but we actually do need them um, to stabilise our planet. And um, so that's why it is very much imperative that we get this involved uh, with planning policy and it is adopted within our council. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor O'Hara. Any feedback you want to, to give on that, Brian? I can see you've come off mute, but I don't know if you want to comment. Um, yes. Um, uh, part of the, um, I think it's probably the supplementary planning documents are things that um, uh, members of the Council's planning policy team and um, the tree management working group uh, are looking at. Um, I'm just trying to think initially, uh, documents that we need to produce in planning would be um, British standard sort of 5837 trees and development really. So we need to have one aligned supplementary planning document and that would form part of the tree strategy. Other thing that we feel is we're very uh, keen that we want to have produced as part of the tree strategy is a planning document that, that looks at the requirements for trees on new development sites. And um, we just need to be careful how we do it, really. So um, some local authorities have documents where if trees are removed as part of development, then there's a certain standard and number and sizes and species of trees that are replaced. We just have to be very careful how we do this because that could be a bit of a sort of a charter for developers then to say, well, we can remove these trees because according to your policy, we can just replace them with all these trees. So we just need to be careful how we do that. But um, yeah, it's definitely something that we want to be part of the tree strategy. And if the tree strategy again uh, is adopted, um, then we can get it adopted um, through as a planning policy as well. And uh, I think that that's, that's vital. Thank you. Councillor Dow. Thank you. Just um, one final point. I was just wondering um, if any consideration had been taken to um, informing, well, maybe not informing the public, but like having something available where people can see in advance that trees are going to be felled. Um, I know 
uh, in the start of last year, there was a big uh, public outcry over the felling of trees at the um, Library and Museum in Ketrin as part of the redevelopment there. Um, and whenever there is a, a street tree, uh, this is uh, actually Councillor House um, when he stayed, uh, sorry, Councillor Watt, do apologise, um, about the trees that were felled in Corby. You know, there's, a, there's always an outcry when large fell, uh, mature trees are felled and it always... Uh, and it'd be nice to sort of have the information in advance as to why they're being failed so that we can sort of stem the uh, the outrage, if you like. I was wondering if that was something that was considered. That's it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. Over to you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. The, uh, I don't know if it made it into the, um, the version you've got. Um, recently, last year, as part of the Environment Act 22, um, the government placed a requirement on local authorities um, to consult members of the public before felling of any, uh, they called it uh, a tree on an urban road. So, you know, read that to be a street tree. So we already have that requirement, but um, as we develop uh, management plans for trees, um, we're carrying out surveys of trees and then we'll have a tree management database, which will be able to um, look forward to the work and you know, pr propose works over the next four, five, six years. And, and that's at the stage where there's, there's no reason why we can't have that public facing so the public will be able to see what management is going to be carried out to the trees close to where they live. And if any trees are to be felled and then have the opportunity to make comments on it, but also see what trees are going to be planted. Um, so certainly the, the way I think that is something that we would do definitely and we'd be looking to do. Okay, thank you for that. Councillor Watt, I'm going to let you as the last comment and then we need to move it, on. It was just to say to uh, Des, uh, uh, the reason we were told that the poplars were removed is that they, uh, somebody says they've got a 50 year life, these these poplars, and uh, they were just removed. And it seemed that they, they must have got a, a job locked quote to remove all the poplars in West Glebe because they all went. It was so disappointing. And you can see that most of them were not um, we're not diseased. Okay, thank you. So I, I think we've given this item a good discussion, as I say, keen to get through the rest of the agenda. Um, so thank you to everybody for your comments on that and for Brian and, and Jonathan for taking us through that. Really useful to have your, your technical knowledge and the hard work that you've been putting into this. Um, so now we're going to move on to Another similar item, which is the pollinator strategy. Um, again, I believe I'm handing over to Jonathan to give us a quick rundown um, on what we've got here. That, that's, that's right, Chair, and apologies, I have some problems with my camera, but I, I am here and listening. Um, so um, the pollinator strategy, I'm, I'm conscious that the panel received a, a thorough presentation on the proposed strategy last month from Chris and Liam. So, I'll just aim to provide a short summary of the document in front of you, which essentially pulls together the strands presented last month into a written strategy. So the principal aim of the strategy is to provide a consistent set of principles in relation to improving habitats on council-owned land for pollinator species, in particular bees and butterflies. And we do this through uh, setting out four key strands. So we've got increased forage resource for pollinator species, improved habitats for nesting and overwintering pollinators, and reduce pesticide use. And the final one, which is to participate in pollinator projects and action. So we're already doing many of these initiatives in areas and, and really we want to, through this strategy, uh, spread that good work out across council managed sites, but also develop new initiatives also. Um, so within the policy, we've set out some next steps, principally the first one around publishing the policy and raising uh, awareness with residents. And we are working on a graphical uh, version of the document, which will look to publish post approval of the strategy and, and looking to share and promote that with residents uh, in terms of promoting the actions we're taking and why. There's also various other actions in there, such as identifying further natural regeneration sites, uh, reviewing our use of pesticides, along with various actions around bespoke equipment, staff training and bedding plants uh, that we use. There's also a section in there about community work that we're doing and how we develop that. And importantly, some performance monitoring measures uh, specifically around pesticide reduction and also areas of habitat improved uh, that we will look to incorporate as part of the performance monitoring going forward. 
So again, I'm, I'm actually joined by Liam, uh, who has led on putting the strategy together uh, and driven a number of the initiatives on the ground or, uh, through already. Uh, and I'm sure again, between us, we'd be happy to take any questions on the uh, paper and the, the strategy chair. Great, thank you. And thank you, Liam, for joining us. Um, as you said, Jonathan, we have had a presentation on this. Um, just for the moment, I can't see any hands up. Um, and that, that's perhaps because members were able to ask and, and have questions answered in that forum. Um, and there they go, all the hands are up at once. <laughs> so Councillor Buckingham. I was on mute, I do apologise. Um, Del and I had the same um, thoughts. Um, there are still parts of this uh, pollinator strategy where I feel that it needs to be strengthened, especially around our biodiversity, because it's not just about um, our pollinators, but the ecosystem that surrounds that. Um, there's nothing about our waterways, and I keep going on about waterways and things, um, and a lot of our um, smaller waterways are uh, heavily polluted, um, but they have an ecosystem of their own, um, as well as the pollinators that, that you know, we need to be thinking about. Um, the second is about the, the maintenance of areas. Um, and again, um, it, it, you talk about um, lot, leaving grasses long over the winter, um, but when they're being those those are being mowed, the 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 rubbish is just being left there, which is more harmful to some of those plants. And you need to we need to have something that shows that that is being looked at. And the other one is the maintenance. Um, so we know that. Um, trees are being felled and some of the rubbish is falling into our waterways and again will have an impact on our um, floodings um, and I'm, we're being told because we were told in the full council last week that, um, that some of our, that it wasn't our obligation to look after our waterways and some of our smaller tributaries it is so we need that to be looked at as well sorry thank you very much it's okay thank you councillor buckingham um do either of the officers we've got want to come back on any of those specific points um we're happy to to go away and look at the points you've raised if not uh, happy to take those away. I, I mean, the the the, the strategy uh, is 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 there in terms of uh, focusing on our land management. As, as Councillor Buckingham says, a, a lot of the, the water management doesn't come under the council's responsibility, but it would be something that we would look at holistically as part of the local nature recovery strategy in terms of uh, how we could look to address some of those issues. Uh, but as, as I said, I'm, I'm happy to take that away as a as a point to how we can factor that into future work. Great, thank you. And, and of course, in terms of linking up all the different points, you, you spoke about waterways there. Again, it comes back to, to using other strategies as well. So the local nature recovery strategy, which I know we, we keep talking about, but that will be important in tying this all together as well to make sure we've got the, the full package on it all. Uh, Councillor Dell. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I've already got a couple of points on this. Um, the section three, Actually, the first one is, um, you, you said that it was quite similar to the tree management and care policy. Um, is it the copy that I'm seeing, the footer on the end of the, on the bottom of the pages actually says it's the tree management and care policy? <laughs> Just a small point there. That's <laughs> um, but the, 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 back to the point, the um, section three uh, to reduce uh, the use of pesticides and reducing phasing out of blanket spraying of herbicides. Should there be a, like a date on that to when that would be, uh, when that would actually happen? Um, that would be something I'd, I'd be keen on. Also, the section participation in pollinator projects and action, number section four. 
Um, it's really good to see that the they'd aim to involve people in improving their environment, volunteering in parks, and including learning about politics pollinators in education ranger led outdoor learning activity programs with schools and groups um could we sort of add something about like not necessarily upskilling but working with voluntary groups so they could uh, do their own um, pollinator projects you know to really empower people to be able to run their own things um like if at home or within their own uh, with their own land or just working with the council um it's be really good to have collaboration in there that was all thank you thank you councillor down for those um, points. I know that Liam um, has been working particularly closely in terms of what we're doing around pesticides and, and use of those, use of chemicals. Um, so he may wish to mm -hmm. chip in. I can still see him on the screen. Yes, no, hello. Yes, of course, my, um, my Wi Fi signal is not strong enough to support my camera today, but I, I have been here listening. Um, we have already started reducing the, the amount of pesticides we use and adopting more. Um, sensitive approaches to weed spraying. Obviously we're working with subcontractors who still work for the highways department uh, um, and carry out weed spraying. And, and we're working together to try and further reduce our usage. Um, so but putting a date on it at the moment um, would be a, a, for further discussion. Um, we, are, we, we have been carrying out quite a lot of work with volunteer groups. Um, obviously the last two years has been quite difficult going into schools, but prior to that, we were working quite closely with schools, um, creating forest school areas, in particular in the Kingswood estate. Um, you might have noticed recently as well, we have been reusing um, trees which would, were, were damaged during the uh, storm Eunice. We've repurposed those into uh, more natural play equipment. We've been, uh, so we have been trying to uh, limit lim limit the, the, the outputs from that. Um, but going forward, yes, we are looking to reduce uh, pesticide use further. Um, and in, in our approaches. Great, thank you, Liam, on that. Um, Councillor Watt. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I can uh, uh, reiterate what Liam has said there. Um, a few years ago, uh, it, what used to be a man on a quad bike used to go around Corby with a spray on the back of it, and every crevice would get sprayed by uh, glyphosate. Um, just the other day, I saw a, a, a man with a backpack just spraying individual weeds. It's obviously going to take him a bit longer, but that's uh, that's the benefits of it. Um, on the uh, po pollinator side of things, it'd be nice if we, if we don't just do natural stuff. I know we have done some uh, some uh, seeded areas, but if uh, we've got some of our uh, industrial states, if we just like positive pollination um collected seeds um put a bit of color in there just not just uh thistles um so it's uh, maybe uh poppies and, and daisies and stuff to make it a bit more pleasant um but yeah fully behind this policy great thank you for your comments on that councillor Watt. and i again i know liam your team um have been working on that um in terms of the points that council Watt raised um, but but certainly wants to take on board. Um, just in, in just going to pause for a second in case um, there was any comments that officers wanted to make in on any of that before we move on. I'm happy chair that they're, they're points that we'll, we'll factor in in terms of the, the further work we'll do as part of developing the action plan. Great, thank you, Jonathan, on that. Um, so. The next stage for this, as we've alluded to, is it will go before the executive committee. Um, the officers have, have, I'm sure, been busily taking notes on the points you've raised, which have been really useful. And I think continue to show the importance of these EAP meetings where we can feed in meaningful actions um, in terms of developing these policies. So thank you for that. We are going to move on to the next um, item on the agenda, which is the last item as well and I know that Greg Haynes is going to take us through this has been waiting patiently so I'll hand over to you to talk to us about the climate impact assessment. Uh, thank you Chair. Um, Raj, is, is it possible for you to share your screen with the slides on please? Yeah, that's fine, <clears throat> I'll just get it up now. 
Thank you. Can everyone see that? Yes. Okay, that, that's good. All right, there, there, there's only a few slides. So um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Greg Haynes and I'm the Climate Change and Sustainability Officer for North Northamptonshire Council. I'm pleased uh, to provide you with an update on the current development of the climate impact assessment and the next steps that are on the project timeline. Next slide, please, Raj. Presentation agenda. Oh, have we gone once, one, two, forward? No, this is the right one. Okay, so we'll, we'll take a look at some background information and then we'll take a quick look at the value and the nature of the climate impact assessment, as well as our proposed approach and design, and finally view the timetable we set out to achieve implementation success. Next slide, please, French. So there's been a few major events over the last 13, 14 months. The uh, council uh, declared a climate and the environment emergency in July, 2021. The council also committed to being a carbon neutral council by 2030. And in February of this year, 2022, the council committed one million pounds to climate change over three years. And that would be the 22 to 23, 23 to 24 and 24 to 25 cycles. Some major actions have also occurred over the um, last 13, 14 months. Uh, the first one being a climate change <coughs> framework was approved before vesting day. Then a climate change roadmap was approved in March of this year. And the North Northamptonshire Council Carbon Management Plan is currently under development. So we've got those major actions happening at the moment, uh, especially for the uh, carbon management plan. So where are we at the moment? Well. As a direct result of recent carbon literacy training and pledges made, I was approached by Katie Jones and Jeremy Rawling from the transformation team with the intention of developing a climate impact assessment. Um, as you may well know, climate in impact assessment is a part of the governance for board and committee reporting. And in the NNC procedures guidance for those reports, there's a section highlighting climate impact. Now, that procedure, we believe could be strengthened by including a requirement for the report author to undertake a climate impact assessment. The, um, the climate impact assessment brings value to the government's process in a number of ways. The first one being that it introduces a corporate-wide consistent approach to evaluate the impact that proposals have on climate. It also helps us understand the possible impacts of those proposals before they're approved, which is the earliest, earliest possible time for an intervention. It helps to identify the best ways to avoid or reduce the negative impacts of a proposal and may also highlight ways to enhance the positive impacts of the proposal. But most importantly, though, it also increases awareness of the impacts of proposals on the climate and encourages research by report authors. In addition, a climate emergency action plan is created by the report author uh, during that during the process. Next slide, please, Raj. So, what is a climate impact assessment? Well, the climate impact assessment that we're developing at the moment uh, currently consists of four parts. 
The first one will be the screening, which will be, for example, filtering out those impact assessments uh, that identify negative impacts on the climate. And then also those uh, report authors will need to go further and do a full climate impact assessment. Then secondly, the climate impact assessment has categories and objectives. There's obviously more objectives um, than there are categories. There's nine categories overall and uh, about 42 objectives, uh, which we would like the report author to go through and identify the ones that are relevant to their proposal. But we'll have a look at that shortly in the next few slides. Uh, the third part is the guidance, which is a separate document that is needed to provide clarity to a complex subject. And it helps the report author um, to understand the, the framing and the context of each category and also its objectives. And then finally, the climate emergency plan in section four of the climate impact assessment provides the actions, timings, measures for monitoring, and the lead people who are going to resolve all of the negative impacts identified in the early parts of the climate impact assessment. Next slide, please, Rush. So th this is the first part of what the proposed approach approaches for the council. Uh, we recommend in this initial implementation that we ask the report author to first identify categories and objectives given in a list, which are impacted by their proposal. And then secondly, to assess whether their proposal has a negative, neutral or positive impact on the climate. Uh, in a future implementation, we were thinking about a point scoring method that may be considered, but as recently as yesterday, we, we received evidence from other councils suggesting that a scoring method is probably a little bit too complex for us at this stage to implement, uh, mostly because it requires an advanced level of understanding across all the services. And we really want to make it fairly easy for people to understand what the requirements of a climate impact assessment are. Next slide, please, Raj. So in the second part of the um, approach here in, in the design, uh, for each relevant objective where the impact is assessed as negative, then we ask the report author to provide an explanation for their assessment, and then also to provide in the next column, a set of actions to be undertaken to reduce the impact, and then to include those actions in the Climate Emergency Action Plan, which is in section four of the Climate Impact Assessment. Next slide, please, Raj. So, like I said earlier, currently we've got nine categories and 42 objectives that have been identified. Uh, these have been aligned where possible with the climate change framework and corporate strategies that relate to climate change. Um, we probably don't have too much time to go through all of the, all of the categories, but some of them are um, buildings and infrastructure, economy and resource use. Um, on, the, on the screen here, you'll see the energy category, which is category C at the moment, and it has four objectives, uh, the first one being decarbonization of fuel, the second one being reducing energy demand, the third one being improving efficiency, and the fourth one uh, talking about the infrastructure that is uh, required to be expanded for including uh, renewable energy. So 
The next slide, please, Raj. So the next steps in the development and implementation are listed there on the screen for you. After Tuesday's update that I made to the Place and Economy DMT and today's update to yourselves, uh, we plan to send out an email to all of the key stakeholders that will include a request to review, amend and recommend the objectives and categories. And in the meantime, work will continue on the guidance document to clarify that and to simplify it as much as we can. Uh, we want to put as many uh, terms, technical terms into a glossary with explanations. So hopefully that will simplify the guidance document. Then later in August or maybe early in September, uh, we'll, want, we'll want to show the CLT, the draft tool, or, or at least um, mention it to them in a verbal update. And then in September, we'll want to pilot it in transformation and do a final review for the CLN in October and then present the final draft um, back to yourselves again in November, and finally go for approval in December 2022 with training sessions uh, in January 2023, which should round off the implementation. Next slide, please, Raj. And there we go. So does anyone have any questions? Thank you, Raj, for progressing the slides for me. If we're short of time, uh, we might be able to sort out emailing. Perfect. Thank you for going through that, Greg. That was really useful. And I think it's a, another step forward for us in, in making sure we're, we're going about this in the right way. Um, I can see that, Councillor, what your hand is up for a question. I know, we, like you said, we're tight on time. So if people can't stick around, um, more than welcome for you to, to put those questions across um, in another way. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, thank you, Greg. Um, we're eight years to be carbon, our state is carbon neutral, um, and we're only just collecting the data. Uh, so, the first question is uh, the sovereign, old sovereign councils, they declared um, carbon disaster a couple of years ago. What data did they collect? around their usage in the, uh, the, uh, of CO2. Um, and it seems that one of our biggest uh, uses of CO2 would probably be our uh, social housing that we have. And uh, we need to get rid of uh, gas boilers. It's been stated in order to, for the UK to go uh, carbon neutral, net zero, gas has got to go. You can't put a gas boiler in after 2025. What preparations have we put in place for uh, air, source heat, air source and ground source heat pumps? Uh, and also, we are we we need to insulate our homes as well, uh, our, our council properties. So uh, the one million pounds is welcome. It's going to be nowhere near enough, uh, but. Um, Eight years to be carbon neutral, that's a big ask. Can I, I'm just going to chip in there, if I may, before I hand over to Greg. Um, so absolutely, it's a big ask, but we recognised it as being the, the right thing to do and in line with what the previous authorities had set themselves up to do. In terms of the data gathering, officers, a number of officers have been working busily to get this data and it's taken a bit of time to be able to do that because we needed um, certain bills, et cetera, to come in, if I'm putting that in simplistic terms. Um, so we, we've had to wait a, a little while and we couldn't simply take information from the old authorities. We needed to look at it afresh. Um, that was the right thing to do to ensure that we're getting the right um, baseline data for us as an authority so that we can make sure we're, we're accurate in what we're doing. Um, so 
hand over to to Greg on a couple of other points if you wanted to to chip in or other officers indeed um, where they've been working on this. Well, I, I can certainly um, take on the first point. What did other other councils do to collect info on CO two? Well, as as far as I know, the the county council did an excellent job in collecting information. Um, I've only been here about nine months, and there there have been um, challenges, as as councillor. Uh, Pentland mentioned in uh, uh, sourcing that information and structuring it so that we can create a, a, a carbon management management plan. And there are, um, in simple terms, other challenges surrounding that. And um, I'm aware that they need to be resolved before we can move forward with um, in, implementing the the plan itself. Um, gas boilers, air source, and uh, ground source heat pumps. Uh, there are technologies out there, um, but it, again, this is. Um, something that requires a lot of lot of funding and i don't believe we're in a position at the moment to start uh, requesting salix uh, funding for projects which are, are are quite large there there are quite a few challenges um such as um accessing contractors that are uh, available and even people to uh to do the work um, and that will also then include in insulating properties as well as as far as uh, council stock goes that that's about as much as i can comment on at the moment can, can i just come back chair um I, I would like to see us as a council taking a, a very proactive uh, stance on this uh, especially on the uh air source ground source heat pumps um because what i hear is there's a there is it needs a lot of education out there on the the on the installation side of it uh we have got such a, a great uh, a large number of houses 10 10,000 plus that we have got a, a an opportunity there to have uh you know a, a company a a, a company a, a council company that would actually do that not not farm it out and actually have um knowledge within the council to sell outside of the council and then bring money into the council um so that we know that we're we're, we're uh, doing things and at the moment we can do one thing which is educate people about turning down their gas boilers their condensing gas boilers so that they're operating in the, the highest efficient mode and that's what we need to do as a council get that information out there to 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 all our residents but particularly our council residents to ensure those that have got council with boilers in there that they are set at an efficient level uh my mum is in the council property the boiler was not set at an efficient level the temperature the outflow temperature was way too high uh and you could be wasting at least 10 percent of of the the gas and at this point in time bringing down your gas bill by 10 percent is going to be key to, to a lot of people thank you councillor what i can see george you've got your hand up yeah thank you chair i'm gonna be super quick um it's really just to just to reassure members that um as councillor pentland said we are um almost um i've almost finalized um our baseline figure uh, with regards to um, what carbon emissions we um, emit. Um, and as Greg has said, uh, the county council, the former county council, um, had a quite a strong grip on uh, the data. I think it was, I think it varied across the other four authorities, if I can be as diplomatic as that. Uh, so that's what we've had to try and um, uh, work through and tighten up to get as an accurate figure as possible. I think in terms of the the, the other points you made, particularly around housing, um, Councillor Watt, you're, ab you're absolutely right. And that's a key strand of our carbon management 
plan that is also um, um, being developed at the moment and we'll, we'll obviously be bringing to um, the EAP um, in the next few weeks. Um, and that will also drive um, uh, the spend then that we will uh, need to embark on um, uh, and prioritize um, over the next um, three years, uh, as well as obviously working with the private sector um, to to do their bit uh, as well, but also to accessing government funding that's out there as well. So just to provide a, a degree of reassurance that there's, there is quite a bit going on behind the scenes. Um, and we will, of course, be bringing that forward uh, to this EAP. Thanks. Thank you, George. Councillor Dale. Um, just a quick point. I can't wait for the baseline figures to be out there so we can get get moving with this. I mean, um, there's a bit, become a bit of a cliche now that we declared a climate emergency, but it's not really an emergency if we've not done anything for a couple of years. Um, so yeah, I'm really looking forward to to stuff getting moving now. We've got this baseline. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And we're still in the early stages of that. We, you know, we, you mentioned two years. It wasn't two years, just in case people are wondering. It wasn't two years ago. But but we're, we're trying to press on with this as quickly as we can, recognising the importance of getting it done quickly. But what we need to do is make sure that we, we've got accurate data um, so that we're, we're doing it properly. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, meant like a year. So <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's all right. No, no, we we recognise the importance of, of getting on with this um, quickly. We're we're doing our best on that. Um, yeah. Um, I'm just sorry. I'm just scanning the screen to make sure I'm not missing anybody um, who wants to make a comment. But I think we've had a, a really useful discussion on all of those points. Um, and, and thank you, everybody, for your input on that and the officers for, for beavering away in the background to bring all of this forward for us. It's, it's really appreciated. Um, so on that note, the last item, as ever, is the date of the next meeting. We've got a double whammy this month. Um, so the next meeting is on the 31st of August. And I look forward to seeing you all there. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. Uh, sorry, wait, sorry, Chair. I think there is one more presentation, actually. I think it's the ecological gardening. Uh, so one... that, that one was all, all combined in with the first oh, one. Sorry um, about that. <laughs> that's all right. Don't worry. Take care, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.